engineer Macasia Ryan. Inside the album, Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction. More info at fullandbloom.com. What year is it that you make the move to Los Angeles? 1986. Right in the middle of that scene there. So were you a staff engineer at Rumbo? No, I was a staff engineer at a place called Take One. And Mike cut uh, for, for Appetite for Destruction. He cut the basic tracks at Rumbo, and then he came to the studio where I worked to do the overdub. What were like a couple of your first projects that you worked on prior to Appetite? Uh, good question. Uh, an album called Talk to Your Daughter by uh, Wiz. Sorry, dude, I can't remember your name. Uh, Talk to Your Daughter, uh, uh, Brenda Russell's album, uh, worked with, with Heart, Everybody Except the Girls. Uh, so it's a whole band plus a couple of, plus a songwriter. and. Uh, then I made, you know, tons of TV shows, uh, movies, you know, really cheap movies. So just did everything. You know, we worked, we worked uh, I'd say, 20 hours a day doing that. I did that for years. And so you came up kind of in that time where you could walk into a studio and get a gig and um, start from the ground up, huh? Yes, I did. I was really fortunate. Um, things just kind of fell in my lap. Um, I delivered bottled water, and uh, my boss gave me a, a request for service at a studio one morning. So I went there, and it happened to be take one, and uh, talked with the owner. And he was he looked exhausted, so I said, "Is there anything I could do to help you?" And he goes, "Can you come back and answer phones at six o'clock?" I'm like. Sure. I, so I got my foot in the door. So. What do you remember about Take One? What kind of board did they have? Did they have multiple rooms? Uh, not at first. When I first started there, um, they had one room. But it's kind, that's kind of misleading because they were centered in a studio complex that used to be known as Kendon Recorders. In Kendon, there were four rooms in that part of the building that were originally belonged to Ken Duncan. Very famous. Kendon Recorders were a very famous a uh, very popular studio. Uh, lo people loved it. And uh, so when it closed down and then opened back up again as take one, people found out that that was, oh, that was Kendon. Oh, I want to go back there. Cause that's what brought Mike back there. I'm not sure he'd worked there before. I think he had. Well, he worked with me a couple times before the Appetite session started. When they came in um, to record Appetite, what kind of board are they working on? A Trident ADB. One of the reasons why Mike wanted to come to take one was because the studio in Rumbo had a Trident ADB also where they cut the tracks. So it was the same same board and same tape machine too, so no Atari tape machine. So Mike knew what he was getting. And so what were those other projects that you worked on with Mike Klink prior to Appetite for Destruction? Mike and I had worked together on smaller projects two times before the session, uh, before Guns came in. And uh, um, we had done a, a, a demo that he was working on, and we worked on uh, guitar tracks for a demo, and we uh, done some backing tracks for a band that was going out on the road that he worked with. So uh, we just did that, and that's how we got to know each other, got to see how I work, and I guess he really liked the studio, so he came in and brought guns there and worked out great. What was Mike like back then? How was it to work with him? Uh, he, he's a prince of a guy. He's the same same guy now as he is, was back then. He hasn't changed a bit at all. He's, uh, um, what he, he was... Uh, he had a, a mop of curly brown hair, and he was, uh, he was, he had the unique ability to laugh at just about anything. He could chuckle and laugh at about any, any weird thing that happened. And we had a lot of weird stuff happen, and you'd just laugh at it, like, okay, dude, uh, I'm with you, you know, whatever you, uh, whatever you want me to do, I'll laugh along with you, so. I learned from him. He took his job incredibly seriously. He took his job seriously, but he didn't uh, take the stuff around it seriously. So that was what I gathered from him. Do you have any favorite stories involving Mike from those appetite sessions? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll tell you one. Uh, we were uh, working in a, uh, it was one, a Thursday morning. He came in and he uh, got a call and we were 
we were waiting for the band to show up. And so he got a call, and the call was from the manager of the of the part the apartment that the band lived in. And uh, so he looked at me, and he had this kind of chuckle, and he goes, "Want to go for a ride?" And I'm going, "Okay." So he hopped in his car, and we drove up to the apartment, and when we got there, the manager was there, and she was frazzled. I mean, you could tell she was just flustered. And she opened up, she opened up the door to the apartment, and let us proceed her and proceed go ahead of her into the apartment. And when we walked in there, every single thing made of glass in the apartment was broken. <laughs> Windows, <laughs> mirrors, cups, saucers, everything made of glass was broken. The mirror in the bathroom was broken, and she was absolutely flipped out. She was just, she just didn't know what, how to handle it at all. And Mike just handles it with great grace. He's like, don't worry, the record company will pay for all this stuff to be fixed. We'll take care of all of it, and you, you don't need to worry about it. Um, and uh, I'll talk to the guys, find out what's going on. And yeah, she was just really frazzled. So, so when we drove back to the studio, he just chuckled all the way. He was like shaking his head. He said, I can't believe that. It was unbelievable. <laughs> was any of the band in the apartment? Well, they lit uh, Slash, Duff, Steven. Axel didn't. The Slash, Duff, and Steven did. They all crashed at that apartment every once in a while. So I'm not sure who was was breaking the... No one was in, in the apartment when you came in? No, no. It was deserted when we got there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they only used it, I think, as a kind of a uh, place where they could crash when they were going between Hollywood and uh, in the studios. Yeah, man. It was a long kind of development period with Guns N' Roses. I know they uh, went through, you know, a few producers and developed them for a year or so. Um, yeah. By the time they're working with you, is Axel cutting vocals or is it just straight up like guitar solos and things like that? Well, we did, um, we started out with rhythm guitars and did rhythm rhythms and then uh, Slash started doing some solos. But the reason we were doing the rhythms was because you had to have the rhythms to cut the vocals. So we would work during the day cutting the rhythm tracks. And then we were finished with that, started on solos. And then the evening, Axel would come in and sing. They just went and cut the drums at Rumbo? Drums and bass. Did Slash and Izzy play rhythm guitars? Uh, yes, they did. The way it went was Slash did all of his guitars, uh, rhythms, leads, so solos, all of that stuff until he was finished. Then Izzy did his parts. But the guitars are always during the day and Axel was night. Because Axel just had, a, there was a lot of work to do on that record for singing. So um, Axel uh, had to have a long time to get it done. Would they come in separately, like Slash by himself? Or would he and Izzy come in at the same time? Nope. That was one at a time. It was, it was like, I hung out with Slash doing his stuff. It took us at least Two and a half, maybe three months, we had all those guitar parts done. Then Izzy came in, and we did all his parts probably in about three weeks because he was a little less improvised. This stuff was a little more uh, thought out. Um, uh, I, I don't know if thought out is the right word. I don't know. Just he seemed to have more of a focus. Slash seemed to be experimenting a little bit. And then Axel would uh, just come in and sing at night. Sing, sing, sing. Are you the one who mic'd up the amps? Uh, that was Mike. He yeah, had a very specific way to mic, and I learned how to mic guitars from him. He's, he's got a very specific way of doing it, and uh, it's really uh, very effective. It worked out really well on that, that album. And do you recall what Mike Klink's setup was? Yeah, it was, uh, um, he, he always used a bottom cabinet, uh, Marshall cabinet. It was always a bottom Marshall cabinet. And then it was uh, the, the amp was a special amp. Uh, that's a whole story in itself. Uh, but uh, the way Mike liked the bottom cabinet was he would put one microphone on the lower left hand corner, and one microphone on the upper right hand corner. And then he would uh, record both of those uh, at the same time. And uh, as a result of doing that, he got a fatter sound of 
just a fatter sound. You recall what kind of mics? Were they 57s or? 57s. Both of them were 57s? Yep. And no room mic? No room mic. And then the amp was like, um, I, yeah, it was like some crazy story of going through a gazillion amps, right? Well, I'm not, I wasn't part of that. They did all that before they came to the studio. They, when they came to the studio, they showed up with the amp. Now, that amp was... Uh, um, it wasn't a JCM 800? Well, I, I think it was it said it was a JCM 800 on the outside, but I think it had been modded. So nobody was sure what the big uh, source of controversy is. Nobody's sure what, what that mod was. Nobody can find that amp anymore. Uh, someone took off with it. It was a great sounding amp, no question about it. And uh, it's just blisteringly loud. It uh, really had warmth, and yet it was incredibly, it had great brightness. It was just a great amp. Um, but it was definitely something that uh, uh, nobody was nobody was sure where that went or where what happened to that. Thing. And did Izzy use the same amp? No, he did not. He was very insistent on using his own amp, which was uh, it's a combo amp. And do you remember how you mic'd his amp? Was that the same thing, two mic technique? No, nope. he only used one microphone on it. Izzy's sound, this is my personal belief, Izzy's sound was what gave Guns N' Roses, made Guns N' Roses more accessible, was Izzy's sound. Slash's sound was spectacular. The, uh, um, the sound from uh, Axel's voice was almost like an alien. Though he has a beautiful voice, I, don't don't get me wrong, I, I think Axel's an amazing vocalist. But his voice on that album had kind of a, a to me, was kind of an alien, kind of a something that nobody had ever heard before. Everybody was kind of doing the high range, but nobody was doing the low range, yes. really, like he did. So it was um, completely unique. I always think that um, he was kind of even what influenced the baritones in the grunge phase, you know, as well. Like yes. it needed his voice to um, to make that OK. That's that's a really great that's a great point. Uh, I never actually thought about it, but now that I think about it. Uh, that does seem to make sense, you know, uh, that people were, they were attracted to that sound. There was something they were attracted to. And, uh, so there, everybody listened to it. But, uh, yeah, but Axel um, actually doesn't, I ne never really, I don't think he, I can't really say this for sure, but I think, I don't think he had a, a big thing, issue with grunge music. I don't think he did. Uh, I think he liked, so the vocals that he heard. I think they took Soundgarden on tour, and but Guns N' Roses, I felt they kind of brought in a more toned down look when everybody was. I mean, '86 is kind of the peak of super glam, lots of makeup and hairspray, and then um, Guns N' Roses came and and toned all that shit down. <laughs> yeah, they did, and they they uh, but they but they had their own look. They had their own thing that that was so easily identifiable and did they kind of look like that when they were coming in the studio were they pretty toned down <laughs> what you see is exactly what i saw when they came in the studio is slash came in with his top hat as he came in with his little belt cap and, and uh, uh axel came in wearing those clothes that he wore uh you know he would come in and sing in those clothes you know uh um you'd have uh skin tight pants on and and uh, he was he's just an amazing you know he had an amazing sense of fashion and a sense of sense of where things were going I, I don't know where he got that from being from indiana but holy cow he sure nailed it when he came out here and some of those early videos i think in the welcome to the jungle video he's got his hair all sprayed up but it's all yep. it's down when he's coming in yep he did tease his hair a lot he did did uh, hairspray his hair quite a bit. Oh, so he was coming in the studio with kind of teased up hair. He didn't come in that way, but he was. We did some photo shoots there. They did some photo shoots at the studio, and he would he would get dressed up for that. He would really spruce up for those. But uh, yeah, he he really did. He he always I always thought it was really funny, even though he would go on and on about you know making himself look look like a glam marker. Then he'd have 
you know, have a sign that says glam sucks is like always contradictory. There was always something contradictory about it. Very iconoclastic in that way. What's it like working with Slash at that time? I know you said it took like three months, but what's he like? Is he pretty responsive or is he kind of wasted or is he coming in super straight? He's such a great guitar player that I would imagine uh, he'd take it pretty seriously. He was, actually they all were. There was nobody in that band that wasn't serious about it. You knew, or they knew that they were going to make it. They knew it. Uh, there was there was no question. It was just it was really interesting to see because I been working with a lot of bands before that. And then when they came in, they were so focused and they were so driven. It was like this is really unusual. These are guys that are going out and drinking at night, you know, and but coming back and they're there every day on time doing their session they work really hard and so to take three months on his guitars what is it that takes so long is it the solos so the, the rhythm tracks i think we got through them in about three weeks all the rhythm tracks uh for, for, for slash then we started on his leads so like little parts that he plays that weren't solos but weren't rhythm parts so we had to figure those out, and there's a million of those on the album. And then we had to do his solos. The solos were, but uh, it was meticulous the way Mike and he worked together on uh, doing the solos. It was uh, they were they paid attention to every little detail in the solo and uh, would correct it if they didn't like it. It was like it was um, pretty impressive to see how hard they worked. Um, yeah, it, I was I was just amazed. And so it uh, sounds like he would comp the solos, like maybe even one solo. It may be a combination of a couple of solos. Oh yeah, it was com It was comp. Everything was comp. The vocals were comp. The drum tracks were comp. The bass tracks were comp. The guitar tracks were comp. Everything that was comping was the big thing in in, uh, uh, in, in the eighties. Comp, you, you comp everything. You're trying to get the best, the very best. And the thing about Guns N' Roses was they had an innate sense of what was what was really good. And like Axel, if he started singing a vocal and he wasn't, he knew he wasn't giving it all, giving it all, his all, or he wasn't getting it all, getting it the way he wanted. It, he'd stop. Like, nope, this is me starting over again. We start over again. I mean, th this was the way all these guys work. Are there any slash stories that stand out? He uh, um, did have a habit. It was really funny. It's like, yeah, I don't know if you ever noticed it. Or we, you won't see it on videos. He'll, he concentrates so hard when he's doing the solos that his lower lip protrudes and his dro drool, his saliva pools his lower lip. And then it'll eventually spill over into long strings of saliva all the way down to the ground. And that happened in the studio countless times. He just, he's so focused when he plays, he doesn't even realize that he's drooling or, or doesn't care. I, I, I never did figure out which one it was, whether he didn't realize it or whether he didn't care. But uh, he, he really, uh, see the thing, another thing I want to point out is People, that when they say that, say, Slash is going to go into the studio and play his music, Slash doesn't play. He works. He works his freaking butt off. And that, is, to me, that's the misnomer of this kind of language of, oh, they're going in to play their stuff. Well, eh, they, they, it's a lot harder than Play. There's nothing frivolous about it at all. And so when he's cutting his solos, is he just sitting in the control room with Mike, and, or is he out in the room? Nope. He, he came in the control room, and he, uh, um, he it would be me and Mike sitting at the console, and then Slash would be between us facing the speakers, and we'd have the speakers turned all the way up, focused directly on him. And uh, it was pretty loud. Any Izzy story while he's cutting his, or any story that you recall? Well, Izzy, Izzy was great about his stuff. Um, he would play it, and then, um, yeah, uh, I really can't think of anything uh, too 
and he got through his stuff so fast. I mean, he got through the the rhythm parts and the and the, his little lead parts in about three and a half, three three weeks, maybe maybe a month. So he just got through it real quick. And Mike didn't spend a lot of time going through all of his stuff because Izzy knew his stuff. I was constantly reminded of that line by Bob Dylan says, you know his song well before he starts playing. Izzy was that guy. He knew his song well before he started to play. And uh, so, and he was a great example of that. He spent all this time while Slash was doing his parts, he spent all this time out in the the breezeway of the studio playing his guitar and listening to uh, his tape player. He had a tape player. And that was, that was funny. He, you know, he, he carried a tape player around with him everywhere. And you listen to uh, a lot of different songs. But the mo- one that I remember the most was uh, um, Keep Your Hands to Yourself. Do you remember that song? I'm not off the top of my head. I'm not. Who's that by? George's Satellites, I think. Oh, of course I remember that song. Sure. And keep, and keep your hands to yourself. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. Well, because Izzy... Um, when I did solo work with him later after the album, um, he hired um, the guitar player from uh, from that band to be in his band. Great guy, can't remember his name, but he was a great guy and a great guitar player. He and Izzy blend really well together. They 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 read each other's thoughts. Pretty amazing to see. So and so then Axel comes in at night. What time do you guys get started? We always started at um, 11 in the morning. Okay. And then uh, if he's coming in at night, what time would Axel show up? He would shoot for 7.30. Didn't always make it. Um, <laughs> so he even had the issue back then, huh? Yeah. But the thing about it, Axel is he has to be in the right print of mind to sing. Um, and... It's taken him a while um, to, uh, it's taken him all these years to figure out that he has the ability to, I, I think he's figured it out, that he has the ability to get on stage and perform and get it right away. But he, back then, he thought he had, he believed he had to get into a, a state of mind, a uh, uh, angry state of mind in order to sing. I don't think he does that anymore. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but uh, I don't think he feels that. I, I don't get that from when he still sings great. Have you seen them live? Yeah, you know, I never, I never saw Guns N' Roses um, live, but um, I mean, I've seen, of course, video and stuff like that. But wow, you really not? I mean, I, sure, I'm preaching to the choir, but you really, really need to go see that band live. They are extraordinary live. Have you seen them since they've reunited? Yeah, a couple times. I saw a show in uh, Kansas City, and then I saw a show in Wichita, Kansas. I went back and saw my friends, and, uh, my friends in Wichita, and then uh, then I got to see the show, and uh, it was a great time. And I was Slash and Axel, and uh, didn't see Duff the second time, but I saw Duff first time. So. Any standout um, moments from that? We talked for hours. I mean, it was it was just a I don't know how to describe it. It was like getting my I hesitate to say this because it sounds sounds so presumptuous, but I feel in a way like they're like they're like my boys, and it's like so when when I get them together, it's like we're getting all the boys together again, you know, like my kids almost. Not not that I treated them parentally, it's just I felt I'm quite a bit older than them. And I took care of some stuff for them, but I, I really wonderful experience working with. And so when Axel would come in to do his vocals, he said he would uh, have to get in an angry state. So would he kind of just be to himself when he came in? Yeah, um, he would would be very focused, inwardly focused. Um, He he was quiet, um, except when he went out to sing. Of course, he wasn't quiet when he went out to sing, but he was quiet in the studio. Never was loud, never was... uh, boisterous or uh, I can remember uh, he was a real gentleman gentleman in the studio I thought 
Did Mike have a system? Did he want Axel to sing through the whole song, like one complete time, and then try it again, and then start comping from there? That's a good question, because it seemed like, it seems like from my memory, that it was, um, it varied depending on the song. Um, some songs, he could blow right through them. Some songs took a little more work of piecing it together, um, doing different parts at different times. And, he, and Axel was very good at knowing what he needed to do. What, what, what He had a very sharp mind about knowing what needed to be done on the song. And so he would be like, you would just go in and do it. I don't even know how to describe it, but some songs you just blow through it from beginning to end, and then we do it two or three times, and I couldn't cop it. But the other ones were a little bit more pieced together. Uh, uh, and, but it wasn't a matter of at living. It was just a matter of some of those things were difficult to transition. Between. Right, the highs and lows, I would think, maybe are yes. on different days. No, he would do. Axel has a genuine four octave uh, range, and literally can sing bass to uh, almost to soprano. I mean, it's like the guy is probably exaggerating that, but he really does have a quite a range, and uh, he doesn't uh, he does he doesn't take a break between singing a low part and singing a high part. He's like, or maybe we'd go in and do all the high parts and then come in and do all the low parts, but we do them all on the same night. Do you recall which songs, any of the songs that took a little more um, work? You know, the funny thing is... Um, Probably not, huh? Because it's not... You know, you're not thinking like it's going to be one of the biggest albums of all time, right? <laughs> well, I, I knew I knew something was going to happen, but uh, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how big it was going to get. But he... Yeah, I lost track. Of any songs that took a lot of work or songs that he blew right through? Are there any standout songs that you recall? Paradise City he did um, kind of maybe two or three takes. So he just, he got, he blew through that one. He also went, got through uh, Welcome to the Jungle, but Welcome to the Jungle has so many parts vocals that he had to do come back and do little bits here and there and piece it together um, he actually did uh, there's a possibility that he didn't finish all of those vocals at take one he had, actually might have had to go to another studio in the valley and uh, work on at the very end, just a few little bits. But, uh, well, there was also the story of Rocket Queen where the chick comes in. Were you there? For <laughs> nope, I wasn't there. I did, did not see any, hear any of that stuff. I did hear about it. I didn't hear, didn't hear any of it. Do you recall what kind of mic you used on Axel? Yep, he used uh, uh, 247. Nice. Did he run it through anything, like an 1176 or anything like that to tape? Used a uh, uh, LA two A, and then of course using the pre's from the Trident. Right, he would EQ it at the Trident too. So um, he used he used board board EQ on the Trident a lot. He likes that. It's a very broad EQ. There's no you can't really get in and notch a certain thing out. Are there any standout moments with Axel? Any wonderful stories that um, I'd hate to leave anything on the table on Axel? There really wasn't too much. He always he always brought his, well, it didn't always do it, but many, many times he brought his girlfriend, Erin, with him. And uh, I always expected her to, um, to make a comment about what he was doing. And she never did. It's like, she just kind of blew it off. And he never asked her. I mean, all the time that she spent in there, you know, I would expect him to say, well, what do you think? How did that sound to you? He never asked her one time. It was the funniest thing. But Axel knew. They, they all knew. They, they just knew. There was something in that band. They, I can't really put my finger on it, but boy, it was, uh, it was a definite magical time are you feeling that at that time or or is that something you kind of reflect on later and think holy shit that was unbelievable i had such a great time making that record 
uh, that record was just, I learned so much. And, I, and uh, it was so new. It, it was such a new experience to me. It was the first time I'd ever worked on an album a long period of time. Every other project before that had been, you know, at the most a week. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a project that lasts three months. You know, so, so that was a real big learning curve. The pressures were different, but they were just as intense, but they were different. They didn't have to get done immediately. They didn't have to get everything done in a weekend. We had a week to do this and two weeks to do this. So that was kind of cool. So we really took the time to do the job right. And uh, that was, to me, that was the very special part about uh, those guys. Because they, they, the other thing was they never complained one time. I never heard one person complain in the band about doing a track, doing a takeover again. It was, Mike wanted it done again, he, they'd do it. No questions asked. They just did it, and, which was also unusual. I mean, I've been around a lot of people that that isn't the case. Those guys were really, really uh, very committed. That was one of my questions, was how Mike Klink interacted with the band. It sounds like they had uh, lots of respect for him. Yeah, they really had lots of respect for him. They also, he was, in a way, in a strange way, he was part of their group. He was part of the the part of the family, um, Guns N' Roses family. They talked a lot. Everybody talked to Mike a lot. Um, Mike wasn't the authoritarian, but he would always challenge the band, challenge them to really make, make it that it was their best, that it was a very best. And he trusted them that they knew what their best was. So that was a very interesting uh, perspective on their relationship is that Mike really trusted them to know when they had done their very best. And so besides Axel kind of being in his own world with Mike, is it kind of a jovial kind of thing or is it all pretty serious? With Axel? Yeah, well, just the atmosphere, even with Slash and Izzy. I'm assuming with Axel, if he was coming in there in a state, then it was probably a pretty serious setting. He, he wasn't. I mean, he did get that way, but we never... Won't say never, but there were very few times where he had jokes. Uh, so okay, Axel would stand. He would come into the studio. And he would sit down and he would talk about what had happened during the day and talk about stuff. He's things that he noticed and stuff. So then he would go into the studio, put on his headphones. When he put on his headphones, he would hear his vocal through the microphone with the reverb on it, and that would send him off sometimes in another direction where he would start talking, and sometimes we wouldn't get, get around. So he would come in and, like, say, 8.30 or 9.30. Sometimes he wouldn't get to singing till about 1 or 2 in the morning. Once he got, once he started singing, I mean, it was, it was, uh, uh, Katie barred the doors. He'd knock it out. But just took a while to get there. So sometimes you guys would be in there from 11 a.m. to like, what, three, four, or five in the morning? Four in the morning. Pretty standard to work on this, on uh, Appetite. We worked, uh, we worked from, I worked as the assistant engineer. I worked from 11 to four, 11 in the morning till four in the next morning. And because uh, I had to do stuff like, sweep up and clean up and, and uh, I had to uh, put everything away, make sure everything was ready for the session the next morning. So I always had a little bit of extra work. But Mike pretty much kept the same schedule though. He was, he worked hard, man. He worked hard on that. And you said that Axel would be in the vocal booth? Yeah. The vocal booth at Take One was the same place that we recorded the guitars in. So I know it's hard to it's hard to describe. The amp was there set up while Axel was singing his vocals. So he was in the same room as those. Oh so. wow. Okay. So it's a smaller room. It wasn't the guitar amps weren't in like a big room? No, they were not. The studio at Take One has a big room in the back and then it has an intermediate room between the back and the control room. So that intermediate room was where 
all the vocals and guitars were cut. It doesn't have high ceilings. It has high high-ish high ceilings, but not like the big room. Did you ever meet Duff and Steven back then during those sessions? Oh, yeah. Duff, uh, Duff came and hung out uh, a good, not 100% of the time, but he was there a lot. Uh, we, we, I spent a lot of time with him. And, uh, um, yeah, Steven wasn't quite, I mean, I had a relationship with him. I met him, but... He, his drums were done, and he didn't really have much to do. And Duff didn't but either, right? The bass was complete, or did he have to do bass any? Was complete. He just loved hanging around. He got a thrill out of it. Are there any so. Duff stories? Well, he, he always, uh, from the moment I met him, the guy always had, always had a red plastic cup filled with some liquid, some kind of liquid. I'm sure it was... Uh, Milk, right? <laughs> vodka and cranberry juice. That was his big drink at the time. Because his his deal was he would drink the vodka, and then to help save his kidneys, he would drink he would drink the cranberry juice. <laughs> it was so funny. But he loved he loved cranberry juice. That's all he drank: vodka and cranberry juice. And he had a red plastic cup, and there was never a time when I saw him where he didn't have that cup. And he, I think, he drank a bottle, a full bottle of uh vodka every single day it was it was it was an incredible amount of vodka but he never seemed i mean he would slur his words a little bit but he never seemed like he was drunk i never he, he's a very gregarious drunk he is very uh very friendly and very warm i had a ball with him any uh steven stories uh caught him i caught up with him one day when he was hitchhiking i was on my way home to get dinner before coming back and working that night and uh i saw him at the at a bus stop hitchhiking so i stopped and picked him up and gave him a ride and uh that was that was the most interaction i had with steven the whole time i was working on the record was that one time where i picked him up and drove him to where he wanted to go and uh i always i told him if you ever need a ride i'd be glad to give you a ride and always you liked hitchhiking did you do some work on lies, or was that just all kind of part of uh, all these sessions? Oh no, no, it was. They came back in and did uh, did um, patience. It, patience was recorded at take one, and um, that was. So were a lot of other songs that didn't make the record. Um, there was uh, some very odd songs that didn't make the record. Those were completely different sessions, huh? Completely. They went out on the road. They finished the record, went out on the road, and then two or three months after they'd gone out on the road, Mike called and booked a weekend, uh, a long weekend, um, to do some acoustic B-sides. And because uh, I think the record was just starting to begin to, they were seeing inklings of it taking off. So they wanted to make sure they were ahead of the curve on it. And Geffen wanted to make sure they were ahead of the curve. So Mike booked a long weekend to uh, record acoustic B-sides. And I think the only thing that came out of those sessions was Patience. But that was that was the hit off of that. Of course, yeah. What, a, nice. what an unbelievable song. And were you there for the recording of Patience? Yes, I was. I was also there for the video. I was in the video. I'm sitting, there's three of us. There's Mike Clink, me, and uh, the other assistant. Jimmy, uh, the guy with the mullet in the middle of the three guys, the guy in the middle with the mullet, that's me. So. Very nice. Sporting the mullet, too. I, I didn't have a mullet when I walked in that day. And when I came in, they sat me down in a barber chair and started chopping my hair. It's like, what are you doing? Like, no, we have to cut your hair. So they cut, they gave, gave me a mullet. They gave Jimmy a mullet, too, so. Unbelievable. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what was that about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, they thought it was the hip, the hip look. Unbelievable. Anything stand out about Patience? Recording that song? Um, Axel, um, because of the setup at Take One, we didn't really have an ISO booth. When the whole band was there, we didn't have an ISO booth for Axel to sing, sit in the sing so he had to sit in the uh stand in the um mic lock which had a solid corridor 
And, and so he couldn't see the band at all. So when he recorded that vocal, and I don't really know how he did it because it's amazing how he did it, but he could not see the band at all when they recorded that song. And uh, so if you, if you listen to that song, you swear they were in the same room together, but they weren't. And is that done like really quick, the recording of that song? Yeah, I mean, the basic part of it was done. The basic tracks in it were done pretty fast. Uh, then I think uh, some uh, guitar solos. We had to do some guitar solos. And then we had some backup background vocals we had to do. And there are a whole, I think all of us, including me, uh, went and did the backup vocals for, uh, for patients. One thing I forgot to ask you on Appetite was Slash using uh, Les Paul. Yes. And he played the Les Paul the entire time? Uh, yep, he sure did. And you recall what is he played? What kind of guitar? Yeah, it was an ES-135. It's a, a single cutaway, semi-hollow body guitar with pickups like a Les Paul on it. So there's this Les Paul-ish sound, but it's got this weird kind of sustain that... Uh, but Les Paul doesn't have. So. And Izzy played that through the whole thing? Yep. Okay. Yep. So final question, when you reflect on the Appetite for Destruction recording sessions, what do you remember most? This record kind of came at me like a truck, truck driving really fast. And uh, it was, I was kind of bowled over by it. Uh, it, was, it was such a powerful record. But at the same time, I, I, I didn't... Uh, I didn't really get how great it was. You know, it was, I should have been able to listen to it and go, that's freaking awesome, you know, but, but for some reason I didn't get that. It just, to me, it was just the guys hanging out, singing the songs. I, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's another day's work when you're doing a record like that. I've made a couple records like that where it's another day's work. You don't realize that it's a, that there's greatness there with me and I think with all the other all other engineers it's just kind of going from one job to the next I was looking to to pay the bills for my family you know for my wife and kids so for me the more work I could get the better off I liked it you know so um, to me that's that's really where my focus was to take care of my family though I worked on some classic records I never really realized it I guess. Slash kind of set the table for Appetite for Destruction for me, uh, the way he was. He was so serious and so earnest about what he did and, and really uh, loved what he was doing. That, to me, that really set the table. He wasn't, he, he wasn't there talking about chicks. He wasn't talking about dope. He wasn't talking about it. He was there to do guitars and that's it. 